My name is Robinson Berkey. I'm one of the co-founders of the Wormhole Foundation. And I'm Dan Reeser, uh, also the co-founder of the Wormhole Foundation. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, as Tom was saying, we've got a lot on the, the docket today. Um, but we wanted to start off with a little bit of a foundation around just what tokenization even is, what Securitize is doing, what Wormhole's doing. And this will hopefully set you up for all the sessions later today that get a little bit more into the details of um, the tokenization space. To kick off, um, just for illustrative purposes, I wanted to see if anyone in the crowd has a guess as far as the dollar value of all tokenized assets located here in New York City. Any guesses? No guesses. OK. Five trillion. Five trillion. OK, so by our estimates, it's roughly 50 trillion. And this includes real estate, stocks and bonds, public infrastructure, equities, um, and what have you. A lot of, lot of value, obviously. Um, in real estate, there's the Flatiron Building recently sold a couple years ago for about 160 million, not tokenized. <laughs> this Andy Warhol also sold just a few years ago for 195 million. And then, of course, the financial assets that we'll be spending a majority of today's time on. 20 trillion roughly in equities located right here in New York City, 1.2 trillion in treasury bills, 10 trillion in bonds, 500 in, uh, in private credit. As you can see, lots and lots of value to be tokenized on chain. And today we're going to explain to you kind of why that makes sense to do. Tokenization. Of course, we have to add in a good meme here. Um, but as Dan mentioned, one of the things we want to make sure and do is kind of go over what tokenization is to set you up for the rest of the day. And the idea is that you're really just taking a traditional asset. So as Dan mentioned, there's a lot of assets within New York City that have the potential at being tokenized and making a digital representation of them and bringing them on a blockchain. Once you bring them on the blockchain, they can then be securely transferred more efficiently, faster, et cetera. And we'll get into a few more of those benefits here in the next few slides. So traditional assets today, why, why do we need tokenization? They currently lack uh, digi digitization. Um, they're more antiquated, a little less inefficient. We have limited market hours, so we're, we're all probably familiar at this point that crypto is very much so a 24-7 market. Um, slow, cumbersome redemptions, and we'll, we'll get into a graph of what redemptions look like today within tokenization. Um, limited access to alternative assets. So I think a good example of this is private credit, for instance. You know, today you, you usually have to work with some sort of broker, have to meet certain minimums, have to, you know, minimums when it comes to purchasing, et cetera. Um, and, and with fractionalization and tokenization, you can have, have access to assets that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. This is what I would probably call the democratization of finance, for instance. Um, and then fractional ownership. So being able to give more people the ability to invest in these types of assets. So Securitize, what is, secu what is Securitize's role in this within tokenization? So thinking about Securitize and why asset managers are tokenizing, we have a few reasons. Number one is greater liquidity and more access to broader markets. Um, Real-time settlement, so blockchains are near instant finality. Um, you have potential use cases in decentralized finance. So when we think about decentralized finance, those have that DeFi in general has an abundant amount of use cases. There's programmability, there's composability, you know, things are run on code, you're able to uh, you know, eliminate some middleman, and the list goes on. Um, you have a reduction in human error a lot of times because those things are running on code, and then you have 24-7 markets as well. So when we think about who the audience is today that is tokenizing things, so we have majority today is asset managers or fund managers. Uh, they're doing this for a few reasons. Number one, there's enhanced tracking and transparency. So blockchains by nature are transparent ledgers, decentralized ledgers. Um, there's instant redemption with things with stable coins like USDC. Um, you can move at very fast paces and with near instant settlement and the market's obviously 24 seven as we've mentioned. Um, you have on-chain security guarantees. Um, you, you obviously have a little bit more of a trustless ecosystem as well. Um, and then again, 24-7 markets. And we already have some large traditional uh, finance firms in the space, uh, like BlackRock, Apollo, KKR, Hamilton Lane, and more that are doing this today uh, through Securitize. And one thing I'll call out, which I think is interesting where we are in the space and the industry now, 
is that we kind of have moved from what I would say is like the 2021, 20, 2022 era of pilots and proof of concepts and wow, this could be great and wow, we could tokenize New York City and these types of kind of like opining on these concepts to you know, months ago when I was sent a Block Explorer link and seeing you know, uh, BlackRock's Biddle money market fund being tokenized and actually sent between blockchains. So it's here now and these, these funds are using it with Securitize. So who's using, who, who are some of the other audiences, I guess, besides fund managers? Digital asset investors. So you can think about these as like digital native crypto companies. So it could be foundations, for instance. So uh, crypto protocols typically have foundations. Those foundations have tre treasuries, and they're looking to diversify. Um, you have uh, new access to money market funds, private credit we've talked a lot about. I really like the idea behind tokenizing private credit because it is, in essence, what democratizing finance is. It's almost like this gated, um, you know, investment opportunity that your average Joe off the street doesn't really have access to. Um, you obviously, uh, a lot of DeFi protocols are starting to integrate uh, tokenized assets or RWAs. We're seeing that more and more. Um, and then things like instant redemption in, in a unified investment platform. And, and apologies for looking at the slides. They don't, they don't have the slides down here for us and we haven't memorized the deck, so maybe they can fix that for us um, in a second. But I wanted to get uh, into a little bit more detail here. We've talked very high level, but um, to walk you through the actual process that an actual fund based in New York City, a BlackRock Biddle Fund, and how they've taken treasury bills and getting investors into the, the on-chain fund, which is called Biddle. I'm not gonna go through every single box, but I'll just go quickly. Starting at the left, um, this is fully permissioned, so KYC compliant, with all of BlackRock's processes, there is onboarding and screening and subscription done uh, in partnership with Securitize. That account is then funded with USDC using ZeroHash or USD, and then the funds are received, and then the tokens are actually issued. So the Biddle tokens are in the wallets of that investor, and then the investor is holding, and these are T-bills, so they're earning you know, 4% or so these days. But the cool part with these on-chain funds is that there's a daily investor balance and a dividend calculation that's then sent back in token form to the holder. So as they're accruing interest, they're accruing more and more of these Biddle tokens in their wallet. And then going to the orange box here, this is when the investor wants to actually redeem their Biddle tokens back into dollars, whether that's fiat, USD, or into USDC stable coins. So at the top, it's, uh, it's more of the traditional process, so this will take more time. You know, you're using banks, you have to wait multiple days for the wire to be issued to the investor. Or on the bottom, which if it was me, I would be using secondary sale using Circle and USDC, and then it's a near instant transaction after that atomic swap from the Biddle token into USDC. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about what Robinson and I spend all of our time on, which is Wormhole. Um, we're working with all these different parties um, on what you can kind of think of as a digital asset network that's connecting all of these tokenized assets across all of the major blockchains. Um, why are people thinking multi-chain? Um, on-chain, if you haven't heard the word, it's kind of like the, the Web3 version of online. So when we think of on-chain, we think of on all chains, not just on Ethereum or not just on Solana, for example. Because these asset managers, they want to grow their AUM, that's the, no, the number one goal all the time. And if you're launching a product, why would you launch just in one market instead of launching globally in this decentralized world across all the major blockchains where there's different users on different chains with different demands? Um, the other thing around that is the investor preference. So there are some people, definitely on the user side, but also on the investor side, who prefer Avalanche, who prefer Solana, who prefer Base, Ethereum. So being able to meet your investors where they want to be is another benefit of being multi-chain. And then we're getting there in terms of DeFi. Um, the fact that these assets are permission makes it a little bit more difficult to get a lot of adoption in the DeFi space now, but I think this is something that everyone in the room should start working on together to, to start getting more adoption of these tokenized assets in DeFi. And I really want to go back to one of the things Dan said that, that's important is this like idea of on-chain, meaning all chains, not one. And at a high level, I think about Securitize in a lot of ways as like the gateway for any maybe traditional asset to come on-chain. And then wormholes the way in which you would unify 
that, that liquidity across all that chains. And when you think about, you know, for the digital, like the crypto native audience here, you, you kind of, we've kind of grown up in the industry, I guess you can say, just thinking about crypto as this very fragmented, these like blockchains, different economic zones, and it in fact is that way in, in a lot of senses. But when, you, when you're talking to these, I guess, asset issuers and having these conversations, they want, part of, part of why you want to tokenize an asset on chain is actually tapping into a new market of users, a new market of liquidity. And if you're only beholden to one of those economic zones, you lose a lot of the value in actually maybe tokenizing, for instance. So where Wormhole, I think, comes into play is uh, making that on-chain really mean just generally on-chain like you would think of something online and not gated to maybe any particular chain. But also, of course, to Dan's point, if you have a preference of being on a chain, you can do that as well, or you can move the asset to, to wherever that preference is. Um, but when thinking about this kind of tech stack, if you will, so remember we have the gateway, which is kind of securitized, and then we have the unified liquidity layer, which is, uh, which is wormhole, you, you, you are trusting this technology, and you should keep, keep some of these things, some certain things we're about to go through in mind. Number one is security is really important. I'd argue for institution security is probably the most important thing to consider when, um, you know, with these assets going between chains. Um, and we can get into, um, please find me after, I'm happy to talk your head off about security requirements and what Wormhole's done, um, but it's quite, quite significant. Um, and then built-in compliance customization, obviously that's a lot of times that's handled via Securitize, but also uh, via bridging front ends that are built on Wormhole. Um, specific burn and mint transfers, we like this in particular because it keeps the fungibility between chains consistent. It keeps the total supply of any given asset consistent between all the chains. Um, you want a credible platform. Um, so Wormhole in particular, we work with AMD, Google Cloud, Circle, uh, and then also a lot of the, the blue chip DeFi protocols like Uniswap, like Lido, um, and, and MakerDAO. Um, and then lastly, yeah, proven technology. Someone that's a, a technology that's done this, that's moving assets today and isn't promising you know, about moving assets in the future. So we're, we're very much so in the camp, similar to Tom coming on here and telling you everything's up and to the right. As you can see with this graph, this is effectively assets being uh, issued or RWAs or tokenized on chain. Um, we think everything will be tokenized or will start to move, move in that direction. Um, in 2024, the market cap of assets, uh, of tokenized assets was up 32%. Um, as we think about, you know, we talk about tokenizing NYC just as kind of a mental model. Um, we, we use the number 50 trillion and maybe we can also talk after this and argue if 50 trillion was too big or too small. Um, but that's what uh, I think the numbers we have is 0.036%. Uh, is what we have tokenized on chain today versus just New York, right? So the TAM, the opportunity size is huge. We're still very early in that regard. Um, and then the last thing, I think Dan brought attention to this, but DeFi is one of those like core reasons why tokenization is so exciting, right? Being able to uh, use these more permissionless protocols, use these protocols that are more composable, that reduce the middlemen, that give you more yield, et cetera. That's something that we really have to continue to work on because while we do have assets that are on chain today, while we do have you know, proof and, and, and we have these block explorer links showing us that they're moving around and people are holding them on chain, we wanna give them that next step. Like what is the, the yield they can get from that? What else can, can they you know, use it as collateral to, to borrow against those types of things? And we're starting to see that, um, but that, I think 2025 we'll start to see a lot more of it. So th that's a wrap. Um, hopefully everyone learned something new around tokenization, what Securitize is up to and why these assets are launching multi-chain. Um, and I'm looking forward to today, all these speakers that are coming today are going to go deep into various of these subtopics within tokenization. So thanks again for everyone for your attention now and then also for just being here today. We appreciate the time. Thank you.